Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Dan. I'm well. How are you? I'm well also. Yes. So I got my uh, audio situation straightened out. Now I have my my headset with the appropriate USB adapter going into my uh, my surface. So I am I'm able to record on the road now. I even have a little ring light that clips to the uh, top Ooh. of my surface, and it's it's round. Obviously, as ring lights are, and so the the hole in the middle is where the camera is. So it's right nice. it's right around it. Yeah, and it, it was a Amazon find for you know eight ninety nine, and I'm real real happy with it. I think it makes me look like a real movie star. Um, yeah, uh, or or one of the, or one of the operators standing by to take your call. Ah, so, there yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you need a a time life book series on home improvement. <laughs> I'm the guy to uh, to talk to about that. You remember yeah. those ads? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah that man. was crazy. <laughs> I remember. Remember when they used to sell encyclopedias on yes. TV? Yeah. Remember when people would have encyclopedias in their in their house? I had oh. a uh, I had a World Book set, 1987 World Book encyclopedia set. Oh, that was a nice one. World Book. It was a nice one. Yeah. It, it, it was the. Uh, it was the the upgraded binding to the leather binding, and uh, oh, I, I had I had the whole set. I mean, my parents must have spent literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars on that. But man, I I used to look up everything, and now, I mean, now that's, there's the internet. That's the internet. That was the internet for us. Yeah, yeah we exactly. Had, uh, yeah, we had we had Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, nice. I plagiarized so much out of there for my reports <laughs> when I was younger. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, I change a couple words in the paragraph here and there. You know, yeah, absolutely. But, Teachers had no, I mean, Are they could you know, buy their own. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Go to the library. Who's going to do that? I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I, I, it was value. It was priceless having that for reports, especially my procrastinating last minute efforts all the time. Yeah. I'm i uh, I'm a big procrastinator too. I, you know, it's funny how, I don't know. Did you ever do this? Did you ever sell yourself on the fact that uh, you're not a procrastinator? You just work best under pressure. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, because I, would, I hate I would, pressure. I hate pressure. I, I, see, no. I, I would constantly sell myself on on that, uh, you know, as being grown up and yeah. being a horrible student for many, many years. It was always, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not a procrastinator. It's just, I actually, I produce better work under pressure. So I wait to the last minute. And then what I, what I put out there is even better than if I, if I did it far in advance. But yeah, you uh, clearly, the, uh, the, the Michael Jordan uh, or the Dark Jeter of, you know, of being a student, you know, absolutely, exactly, you know, exactly. Just, you just produce under pressure, right? Mr. October. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I don't do, I don't do anything all season, but if my team happens, <laughs> happens to make it to the playoffs, that's when I really shine. <laughs> oh, oh. Reggie Jackson, right? Yeah. Um, that's hysterical. Yeah, no, I, um, I never liked pressure. I was on the swim team when I was younger and that's an individual sport. I love team sports. I played soccer, but you know, growing up, my dad wanted me to get into swimming. It was really good for my, for my health being a diabetic and stuff. So, you know, we were, but that was an individual sport and unless you were on a relay team and I love that, that was great. It was, you know, that, that was fantastic, but being up there on the block as a kid, in the speedo, I mean, it doesn't do, doesn't do wonders for your self esteem either. You know, you're already feeling a little insecure, <laughs> right? And you're up there in front of in front of girls that you're going to to school with too, right? right. And so, yeah. And sometimes there's there's shrinkage, Jerry, and uh, you know it's cold some some mornings, you know, sure up, in, up in New Jersey. So, uh, yeah, man. Um, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, that reminds just, me of my that pressure. I just never, I really never liked that individual pressure on me. You know, my my current uh, the current thing I'm struggling with right now is, uh, you know, I've been shopping for a new uh, pair of swim trunks, and for whatever reason, I decided I wanted a white pair because I think they would look <laughs> nice on me. <laughs> Being uh, being a little bit tanner than I usually am here. Sure, here in the summer. Sure, show off that tan, you. And so yeah. I'm, I'm on my I'm on my second pair of white swim trunks, and I don't know. I guess I'm just not spending enough money to get high enough quality swim trunks because Ooh. when as soon as those white swim trunks get wet, you can everybody at the pool can just see everything. So your second pair. What happened to the first pair? I wore them and sent them back to Amazon. Told them oh, that, uh, okay. yeah, I was like, "Hey, these, uh, this is not, this is not. I can't be wearing trunks to Disney swimming pools where I am right now, or or the public beach where as soon as I get in the water, people could very clearly tell my circumcision status." <laughs> so there's. <laughs> 
that's not okay. I don't want to so, get on. I don't want to get on a list. Well, there, you know, there, you, there are actually some beaches where that's allowed. So uh, here yeah, in Florida, but yeah, yeah there, yeah. there are. But I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not currently frequenting those, those beaches. And, and if I were, I probably wouldn't care about such things or, or wear swim trunks in the first place. Right. But, you get your, you get your, I'm, you get your Wonder Woman swim trunks with the invisible jet. Right. Just kinda, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Just pretend you have them on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But right now uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a member of that lifestyle. So yes. I can't, uh, I can't rely on things being okay that aren't okay. And so I don't know. There's, there's some real, real fancy white swim trunks that uh, they're by, by the company that uh, Orla Bar Brown, they make, uh, they've, they've made several of the swimsuits that, Daniel Craig and Sean Connery have worn in their uh, James Bond movies. Okay, yeah. And they're a few hundred dollars a pair. And so I'm sure those white swim trunks probably aren't see-through, but I don't know that I want to want to take on that choice. Well, I noticed you've got the white V-neck on today. Do you have the matching swim trunks underneath there? I do you, not. That, no, okay. No, I'm right. just wearing a pair of khaki say. shorts. Oh, <laughs> disappointing our YouTube viewers. Yes. Well, I'm used to it. So, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, disappointed them even more by not uploading our videos the last dozen episodes, I'm sure. <laughs> no, you got to put them up. We got to put them up. We got to get them up there. Um, yeah, we'll, all right, it, yeah. It's on the list. We'll get around right, to it. All right. Yeah, we'll get around to it. All right. So yeah. we're going to, uh, you and I are going to attempt to support this week's episode. Uh, we're recording this on July 1st, and it'll come out on Monday, July 4th. Happy Independence Day. Unless you're a woman, but that's that's another <laughs> that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> um yeah so uh we'll we're going to try to support our release of the new episode with some uh additional social media posting so yeah everybody can excited look, about that look forward to, to that uh see if we actually decide to follow through with that or not it's it's it is a bit more work to try to support your social media presence but we'll we'll attempt to do that mostly through our instagram which is the easiest one for me to use because it's uh, the platform that i'm most active on personally anyway so we'll see how that goes yeah, I'm excited for that, um, and want to thank Virginia Elder for uh, for you know helping us out here and kind of giving us some guidance. And that's uh, basically our our podcast advisor at this point. Oh and, yeah, uh, she yeah. When it comes great. to that, she's really great. So uh, anything we don't we don't perform well or follow up on, it's not her fault. It's it's, no. it's, it's an issue of our motivation, not an 100%. issue of her, of her expertise. <laughs> Yeah, what she's provided us, you know, is great. What we're going to put out is going to be mediocre. So there we right, go. Exactly. Yeah, just yes. setting the expectations. Yes. If you don't like what we're doing on social media, blame us. If you do like it, credit her. Yep. Yep. That's only fair. All right. So speaking of motivation, Dan. Oh, um, hey. Hey, now. Look at us with our. Look at that transition. I wow. Know. Seamless. Um, just like your swim trunks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, all right, so yeah, section two of uh, of our favorite book here, uh, Why uh -huh. Has Nobody Told Me This Before by Dr. Julia Smith. Section two is on motivation, and uh, I'm excited because this, this section allows me to do a little bit of light lifting this week since uh, motivation and habit formation and development is really uh, your, your forte, not mine. So um, I'm going to ask you about these things and let you uh, let you riff on what the book says, as well as what your previous experience has been in this area. Sounds good. All right. So um, with understanding motivation, it uh, there's, there's a lot of what I believe to be false beliefs about how motivation de develops and how it can be utilized. And I think people get wrong a lot because I've gotten it wrong a lot my whole life. So mm -hmm. uh, she does a good job of sort of killing some of these myths and uh and i'm sure you'll be able to support that with uh, and and i'm going to work off the uh little chapter summaries which are very handy that she puts at the end of every chapter where she basically says you know, she's real good at the whole uh here's what i'm about to tell you here's what i'm telling you and here's what i just told you mm -hmm. uh, uh mode of, of teaching people things and so i'm going to leverage that as much as i can because uh again motivation is something i definitely struggle with and in understanding a way to utilize the way my brain understands and and motivates me to do things is something that I'm looking to develop a lot with both this book and the next book we're going to do, which you and I just decided on at our at our last breakfast that we shared together, which is we're going to do tiny habits. And I guess it'll be um, what about six weeks from now we'll start the yep. tiny habits book and uh, do uh, do some episodes on that. And uh, so, yeah, let's uh, this is this week is for uh, is your chance to shine. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to letting you do it. 
<laughs> so first is, you know, let's let's talk about we, we have I think in our culture, we have a lot of assumptions about things that people are born with versus things that people learn. And I think. Uh, being a highly motivated individual, just like being a leader, people will often credit it as being something that you're born with versus something that you can learn. And while I think that, you know, you can you can certainly be born with um, a natural tendency to adopt certain skills over other skills, um, I do think that motivation and leadership are things that are eminently trainable and not something that you have to just hope you won the genetic lottery with. Do you agree? I do. I do agree. Yeah. And, and, you know, just kind of like with epigenetics, you know, your, your genes, depending on the things that you do in your environment in terms of the, the amount of food you eat, the sleep you get, the, the rest you have, you know, how much exercise you do, all of those things will then be, um, will turn on, you know, basically, you know, allow you to turn on different, different cascades of hormones and things like that. So mm-hmm. I do think that there is differences in terms of how easily somebody is motivated based on what's happening. It's, it's, it's really difficult to distinguish to say, Hey, somebody's more motivated than another, because you've got all these environmental factors that affect, you know, that, that will affect that. But there are some consistent uh, things that can be done to help maximize your capacity of being motivated. Yeah, and one of the uh, one of the things she's talked she talks about, and you and I have discussed before, is I mean, even with the social media stuff that you and I are talking about, and and what we've worked with Virginia on, it's so it's so important to develop systems because you can't just rely on good feelings in the moment to do that thing that needs to be done in that moment. Exactly. You have to you have to set as much stuff up as automatic as you can, so that your own feelings, your own emotions, your own levels of motivation can be minimized as much as possible because when it is time to do that thing and you're feeling great about doing that thing, then wow, it's just super easy and, and you don't have to worry about it. But when you don't feel like doing that thing and you have a system in place to do that thing, you still have a path to get the thing done that you've already, you know, the previous version of you that decided it's important, they're relying on you to have a system because motivation, at least in my case and in most most of the people I know, motivation is just too come and gozy to rely on it 100% of the time. Yeah, it's basically, she kind of sums it up to, it's it's similar to emotions and feelings where you don't feel something the whole time. You don't, you're not happy all the time. You're not sad all the time or hopefully not anyway, (laughs) you know, and, and they're just, just like emotions come and go. Motivation comes and go as well. Yeah. And, you know, being all we can we we can't uh, i like the way that she she describes how motivation is not just a tool that you put in your tool belt and you take out when you need it it's 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 a bit more sort of fleeting than that because you're you're not in just like a, a good you know a, a good high mood as opposed to a low mood you're not you don't get to just decide i'm going to be in a good mood but what mm-hmm. you can do is you can decide on the precursors to good moods and get those things in place so that when a good mood could happen it will happen same thing like yeah. with motivation you all you can do is put the things in place so that when motivation can happen it will happen yeah you can't just decide to be motivated yes correct yeah, I think I think I think it's important, you know, it's just when when you are highly motivated that you you work on building those systems that you talked about. Right. Because exactly. That's that's what you should be doing when you when you blessed or you just happen to have that that high motivation. And so some of those systems are, you know, for example, reading some of this, some of this book and kind of realizing, hey, what are the things I need to do to increase my motivation or ha- increase the chances of me feeling motivated, as well as building the system around that new habit or that change that you want to put in place, right? So so use the energy for that and not actually trying to do that, at least initially, don't use right. the motivation to try to, to actually just dive into it, right? Use that motivation to go, okay, I can be a little bit patient now. I can plan things out. And a lot of us, you know, patience is just doesn't exist anymore. So, and I'm guilty of that absolutely from time to time. So um, that's something to think about doing is use that motivation to set yourself up for success in the future. Yeah, and I and I think it speaks to what we've talked about before about the the importance of being mindful and understanding what's going on inside you. Because, you know, imagine that you are struggling with 
you, you really want to, you know, get back in the gym on a regular basis and it's important to you to get back in the gym. So you wake up one day and all you can think about is how great it would be to go and lift or go and run or something like that. So, you know, rather than just, just indulging in that feeling and going to do that lifting workout or that run or whatever, you know, imagine how much more valuable it would be for your future self if you said, okay, before I actually do this, I'm going to take five minutes to journal about what it is with my current mood that makes me feel so good about going to the gym. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to notice what it is, you know, that is making me feel this way. I'm going to write some things down about what, why I'm feeling this way. And then I'm going to go do the thing that I'm feeling like doing, but then you've got that resource for, you know, if, if you're feeling great on Monday, but then on Wednesday, you're not feeling like going to the gym, just pop open your journal, look and see what it was about Monday morning that made you feel like you wanted to go to the gym and work out so bad, and then see if reading about it can, can bring up any of those feelings. That's a great technique. I, that's why I like that. Okay, let's talk about uh, chapter number two, where uh, she gets into... Or chapter uh, seven chapter seven yes. of section two so yeah chapter yeah, yeah it is so confusing to uh yeah these these sections and chapter numbers so yes chapter seven section two uh is titled how to nurture that motivation feeling um so yeah she talks um she, she gets into what i what i just said about the idea of you, you can't just flip a switch and decide to be motivated but you can get those motivation precursors kind of lined up in a way that will um, foster motivation's uh, ability to spring up when conditions are right. Um, one of the things that talk, she, she gets into is just moving your body is a way that will lead to motivation. And I wonder kind of what the, what the physical uh, part of that is. What are, the, what are the hormones or the mechanisms that, that kind of take over when you move your body that will make you feel motivated? Is that just a dopamine thing or what, what do we think that is? So, I mean, I, I have limited knowledge here sure. uh, as well. Which is, so I, which is I more think, than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the principles she actually talks about in, in chapter six too, is that our brain is constantly monitoring what our body is doing in terms mm -hmm. of our, our heart rate, our, you know, our breathing, um, whether we're moving our muscles at all, and then it reacts to that information. So basically, um, when it reacts to that information, it's making a judgment about how much energy it's going to need to do whatever task you're trying to do. Right. So um, a lot of times I know I get stuck in my own head and start to assume that something's going to be really difficult or it's going to be a, the mo a more, a much more, and usually it's much more difficult than it actually is. So what I found is, you know, once you start just doing some sort of physical movement or just start that task slowly, you start to feel it, it kind of gives that feedback a little bit of a positive feedback to your brain going, okay, this isn't so bad. And it, and you start to also not, you know, uh, re recycle the, the feeling or the, or excuse me, the thought that it's going to be difficult. So I think it does two things. One, there's probably some sort of hormonal cascade that helps. And it's probably related to some sort of dopamine. Um, but also um, it, it distracts your brain from, re, you know, basically regurgitating this, this negative feeling of how much energy it's going to take because you have to focus on what you're actually doing. Even if it's just walking to the mailbox, sometimes it's just like, okay, you know, just one foot in front of the other. And then, and then let's not, you know, let's cross the street. And, and now before you know it, you're not thinking about that anymore. And so then you're like, well, I'm already kind of doing this. So I might as well just continue past the mailbox and just continue to walk around the block. Oh, this feels good. And then maybe you just go a little bit further. So it really, you know, my mom used to tell me as a kid, I was like, yeah, when I would fake being sick um, and didn't want to go to the school and, and, you know, we would get picked up by the bus at the, at the bus stop. And that was maybe like three blocks away, um, you know, and, and my mom would be like, just get outside, get some fresh air and, and walk to the school bus, the bus stop and you'll be fine. And, you know, I begrudgingly would do that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. And I did, I mean, it's not, it's not like I was, you know, I was faking being sick. I was feeling not great. I just didn't feel motivated. I didn't want to go to school. And she's like, just get your ass out there and just do it. And so, and it, it actually, it did something there. So um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I think it's, related to, to, uh, you know, to, to a little bit of a hormone and, and also the, um, you know, the distraction. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, it, 
it really does feel like almost everything we do as humans gets better if we are active with our with our bodies you know the the human body is was not built to sit at a desk or sit on a couch and the more we spend time doing things that uh you know sort of activate the systems that made us good hunter gatherers the more the more we're ready to take on a variety of challenges and not just you know actually hunting for food or trying to gather berries it's it just translates to to everything everything we as humans decide is worth doing just having a a body and mind that are both active makes us better at whatever that thing is yeah yeah um what one of the things that uh I like is is something that you talk about a lot when when we're talking about motivation, um, which is staying connected to your goal. Meaning, and, and I take that to mean why why do I feel like this thing that is not easy is worth doing? Yeah, and and how how can we spend time connecting to that understanding of you know I I'm looking to get this thing out of my life, and so it's worth it's worth doing the steps that get me there, even when I don't feel like it. What, what are the ways we can connect to that process? Yeah. I mean, you spoke about it and that's journaling and that's, more importantly yeah. and, and reviewing. And so, you know, I think it's, and she talks about this here as well. And I think it's, that's one of the most critical parts of any kind of kind of habit change again, is when you've got, when, when you are, right, you, you know, you're, you're excited, you could start this new habit, put part of that, energy into starting the, the habit really of, of journaling and reviewing what you're writing. And again, it doesn't have to be huge. It could be a minute or two at the beginning of the day and a minute or two at the end of the day. But I found myself when I do that and I've just restarted with my five minute journal and it's, it really helps the other areas of my life because I'm able to reflect on it's right there in front of me. And it's not an overwhelming type of task to, you know, to write a couple of things down during my day. It allows you to then, you know, write a couple of sentences about what your why is, what your goal is, and then what you're going to do, you know, towards that for that day. And then you can review that at the end of the day, but you make that the tiny little habit first, right? You, mm-hmm. you do that first before you start anything else so that, it takes very little energy. You make that part of your routine. The idea here is any type of change, you need to make it to the point of where it's like driving a car, assuming you know how to drive, where you don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> right, right? right. And and so it just becomes just saying like brushing your teeth. You're just somebody who brushes their teeth every day, somebody who cares about their dental right. health. You become so it becomes part of your behavior, your routine, and eventually your identity, so that it takes very little energy, you know, to open up that journal and take a look at it. And then you can go, okay. I really don't feel like going to the gym today, but it's very easy for me to open up that journal. Now I see that why. And now I'm like, okay, I forgot that I want to be, have more energy and I want to live longer to be able to play with my kids. Right. And so, okay, maybe now I'm, I'm, I've got a little bit of drive to just like walk around the block. It doesn't have to be going back to the gym, right? You, you start small, you, you keep it small so that you feel good about it. At least something active, right? Yeah, um, one of the things I've learned from friends of mine who have uh, experienced uh, really big weight loss, where they went from you know being what they consider to be unhealthy to healthy as a as a function of how much extra body weight they were carrying, was the uh, the relationship of shame and guilt is mm. not not as intuitive as we think it might be where, you know, if you just look in your mirror and you decide you're disgusted with what you're seeing, Oh, no problem. Then you can start eating less and exercising more. And it doesn't really, and everybody I've talked to, it doesn't work that way. What works is getting your, your mindset and your mental health in a place where you can love and appreciate yourself as you are. And then the motivation to take care of yourself is what comes. So it's not, you know, I hated myself when I was, when I was fat, then I lost a bunch of weight and now I love myself because I'm skinny. It's like, no, the way it has to work is you start loving yourself today. And as a result, you start treating yourself like someone that you love and the, the, the weight on the scale as arbitrary as that is, it can be one of the things that will show off that, uh, that new, newfound love that you've had for yourself and that appreciation for your body, it, it doesn't seem like it would work that way. It seems like you can, 
you can shame yourself into doing things that are good for you, but no, it, it's the, it's the learn to, to appreciate yourself and value yourself and feel like you're worth doing good things for. And then whatever that thing is that you think you want, you need to, to make your life good, that will kind of happen as a symptom of having that love and appreciation for yourself, which again, isn't the way that you might think that it would work, but in every person I know that's accomplished those big goals, that's the way that it's worked. Yeah. And, and Dr. Julie states a couple of, uh, cites a couple of studies that basically support that idea that uh, as scientific state studies that show that, you know, when, when you are feeling made to feel bad about something, whether it's by somebody else or yourself, mm -hmm. a lot of times you want to block those feelings. You don't want to have those feelings. You don't want to hear them. So she even says, if you've got addictions, this is dangerous to do that to yourself because you're more right. likely to then dive back into whatever you're addicted to, to block those feelings. And that makes sense. We don't want to feel bad. And she, she, she goes in the book, she goes through a couple of questions and says, Hey, you know, how do you feel when somebody supported you, when somebody, you know, gave you compliments and it, it's, it's, it's exciting and motivating and it makes you feel good. It makes you want to do more things and not kind of shy away from things. And I heard one time somebody was, and I think it was actually in tiny habits where uh, BJ Fogg was talking about, isn't one of the examples she, he gave was somebody who had a habit of biting their nails. And one of the ways that they stopped doing that was by going for not, you know, they've tried everything They you know, put like, you know, toxic tasting stuff on their nails and, you know, tried all these different therapies, but it really didn't change anything until they actually started going for manicures and basically oh, they'd get a manicure and their nails would look really good coming. She, her nails would look really good coming back from the manicure. And she would basically then go, okay. And then she started to change her identity around. That it was like, I'm somebody who has, you know, beautiful nails and started to appreciate the way they looked. And so just like you, you know, to go, go back to what you're saying is you need to love yourself. She started to love her nails. And because of that, she didn't, she wanted to do things that supported and 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 took care of and showed off her nails. So when somebody says you've got nice hair, you, you know, you maybe you, you want to take care of it a little bit more. You got a nice beard, you want to take care of that a little bit more. You you take start taking a little bit more pride in it when you when you when you got some positive feedback about that, and then you can apply that to your entire body or being. I think a similar type of mechanism is at work there when you're getting positive feedback versus negative. Yeah, I. Uh... I like that. I think that's an important message for people to hear and to understand that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't hate anyone else into good things. So why would you be able to hate yourself into good things? Yeah. Those, I mean, and you get the, unfortunately, you know, you'd see, you know, some shows on TV where personal trainers are, you know, yelling at, right. the, at people in the gym and, you know, and they're doing it or, you know, drill sergeants are yelling at, them. but yeah, again, the, the, the studies and common sense, if you think about it, doesn't work. And I've met right. many more people who go, I'm not going to the gym because I don't want to be yelled at by a personal trainer. And I've heard that many times. Right. And right. the right, the right personal trainer is going to motivate you not, <laughs> not step on your head when you're trying to do a push up. Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the other things that comes up in this uh, section is about rewarding yourself when you, you know, when you, when you break down this big goal and you start doing the very little things that lead to getting you there, um, giving yourself small rewards along the way. And I was curious, uh, when I was reading that part, I thought, what's the, what's the smallest reward that you've either heard of or come up with to, uh, to reward yourself for something like what's, what's the littlest thing you can think of that can set off enough of a dopamine dump to say, okay, this is something worth doing again. Yeah. So he talks about, oh, excuse me, he, because uh, I was about to pull out uh, more information from uh, Dr. Fogg from Tiny Habits. Yeah. Um, so excuse me. So she, uh, Dr. Julie talks about, yeah, the difference between internal versus external rewards and says, you know, as you're going along, it's very important to have these small little rewards to keep you going. And um, typically the, and, and in, in Tiny Habits, Dr. Fogg also talks about that internal, that internal feeling that you can generate in yourself to release that dopamine and make you feel proud, basically, or or you know, just the, he he refers to it as as shine, like a, almost like you're you're beaming, you know, because you've got this warm glow inside, and um, so Dr. Fogg actually has 
for me, I've always kind of struggled with that saying, okay, well, what can, you know, just saying, Hey, Dan, good job. Isn't really enough for me anyway, to kind of keep me going when I don't feel like going. Um, yeah. And then, so I'm like, well, you know, what kind of external rewards? And then sometimes external rewards don't fit because I'm like, well, I want something and it's super expensive and that's going to stress me out because it's like, I'm going to spend more money on it right, that I don't right. have. Yeah, so yeah. that's not going to make me feel good. Right. So what's great about the tiny habits book is he goes through a hundred different ways you can, uh, or different ways you can, you can create that, that inner, that inner shine, that inner feeling. And there's, I give you a couple of examples, for example, um, uh, you know, um, humming a few seconds of uh, a peppy song that you like, you could, you know, raise your arms up in, in like as a victory symbol um you uh you could picture you know the the look you get from your spouse or your children as you walk through the door at the end of at, you know, at the end of your day or you know when you come home and greet your your pet how that yeah. makes you feel right and just trying to visualize those things uh when when you've accomplished something when you've when you're starting that new behavior that 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 you want to turn into a habit it's important to associate that with that that type of celebration and that's that internal reward and there's and he's got like a hundred different of them in in the tiny habits book and it, that is what will not only keep you going but also will help you remember to do that habit when you make yourself feel good your body wants to repeat that it's the same thing when you eat something really sweet our bodies are pre-designed to remember that and to want to do that again because it's beneficial for energy levels. Now, when we do that too often, that's that's another story. But right. but that's it's the same it's the same exact cascade of 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 hormones that basically reinforce that and make it easier for the next time. Yeah, that's uh, something I definitely need to integrate into my my process of trying to develop. Um, new healthy habits is is taking a second to you know break it down as small as i can and then give myself a little bit of momentary credit for doing those little tiny steps that uh that get you there where um you know one of the things she talks about is small and consistent beats infrequent grand gestures you know instead of you know going to getting getting excited about going to the gym once every six weeks and then just working every muscle group to failure so that I'm, you know, wanting to die and can't, can't get myself off the toilet, you know, for the next week. Cause my quads are so sore like that. That is not what's going to lead me to the result that I want. It's the, you know, just getting up and doing a little bit every day. That's going to get you, get you where you want to be. Yeah. And, and, and part of that is difficult because, you know, when we're super motivated, we're like, Oh, now I, I'm, I'm motivated. I can, I can fix all of the things that I right. wasn't doing over the last yes. six months and exactly. you go super hard. And then, and, and you, so that's why it's very important to really start to believe and understand, you know, what, what science shows, what, what has been shown to be effective, which is small and consistent. And you really got to get, you really got to believe it. You know, you, because if you don't really believe that being small and consistent is going to lead to the actual change that you want, and you think the only way to do that is to go hard and, and, you know, every once in a while, you're, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult when you need to scale back. Because what happens is, is as you start building this new habit, you know, you're going to start doing more and more and more and more, but there's going to be days where, you're sick or you don't have time and you need to be okay just doing that very tiny habit, which might be just walking around the block instead of going to a to the gym for an hour and a half. And right. you need to be, and you need to really believe in the fact that, Hey, it's okay that I'm doing this and it's okay because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm working on preserving the behavior and the habit rather than thinking I'm not going to bother with it because it's not going to get me the results that I want. What's going to happen though, is you got to realize that if you don't keep up that habit, it's going to go away and you're not right. going to be, you're going to be watering. You're going to be feeding, you know, not going to the gym and not exercising and not moving. You're going to be contributing to that rather than just going around the block and contributing to keeping that up. And before you know it, if you don't do that, you now don't identify as somebody who exercises and you don't, you're yeah. not somebody who does those things. And, and that's, that's the, 
it's a subtle type of, you know, it, it happens on a very uh, subtle level, but it, it, it's, it, I think it's what happens to a lot of us. Yeah. And you and I are, um, I mean, we keep, we, we are frequently citing the example of going to the gym because that's something that, uh, you know, both you and I uh, struggle with me more than you, I think, but uh, a lot of people do. And so we're just using it as an example because it's easy and, and yeah. very easy for a lot of people to identify with. Um, one of the things that I picked up from the last chapter in this section is, you know, so much of the time we decide that we want to make this change or do this thing. And we understand very little about why we want to do it and what it's going to actually take for us to get it. And so I had an idea when I was reading this last section, based on an experience you and I had at breakfast on, was that Tuesday morning? I think we went to breakfast. Yeah. Um, when you decide that you need or want the motivation to change something, um, and that as a result of that, you're going to take on a goal that you want to work toward. One of the best things I think you can do is share that with a close friend and almost, almost encourage them to interview you about it. You know, oh, ask I, you, I like the, I like that approach. I've never heard yeah. that before. I like it though. Yeah. Ask them to, to come back to you with the, the who, what, where, when, how, and why of, of this goal that you've decided to take on and then just talk to them about it. And, you know, not just for an accountability where they get to, you know, help you, you know, stay accountable and like you, like you've got someone to report to, because that, that could go negatively if you don't pick the right friend, but yeah, just the idea of, Hey, if you, if you ask me about this, then I have to think about it. I have to put it into words and I have to hear myself say it back to you in a way that will give me a greater understanding of what it is I'm trying to do and how it is, uh, why I'm trying to do it and why, and how I'm going to go about doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I, you and I sort of fell into that on Tuesday morning. We were talking about doing Tiny Habits as our next book, and and you, you and I using that to help me form some some more habits about getting to the gym on a more consistent basis. So, I think uh, I think that's a tool that a lot of people can use when it comes to taking on a goal that you find important. You know, get get with a friend you trust and and get them to interview you about it, and and you can reveal some stuff to yourself and to them about why and how this is going to happen. Yeah, that plays really nicely um, into yeah the last chapter there because she talks about just I guess being aware of what you're trying to change, and so yeah. one of the things she talks about is you know reflecting on the situation and then journaling is one way of staying connected to that why and staying staying making that that new change top of mind. What you just suggested is just another way to reinforce that, which is great, which is having people around you who are aware it's that accountability, but basically you're going to run into more reminders of what you're doing and why you're doing it by, right. you know, by bringing your friend into the, into the loop as well, or family, whatever that might be. And that's something that I have neglected and not done as well as I could have in my life for sure. Um, in terms of either just like reviewing the journaling. So, I mean, simply just, I mean, I'm good about journaling, but I, I rarely go back and review what I've written in terms yeah. of like at the end of the day I do because I'm, I, you know, uh, I've written at the beginning, but I don't go rarely do I go back and look at the week or the month beforehand, which is super valuable. Every once in a while I'll do that. Not nearly as often. It's not a habit for myself. So actually just this morning in the five minute journal, there's mm -hmm. a section for your daily affirmation. And I wrote, I am someone who reviews their journals to remember, learn and improve. Nice. And so part of that is, and, 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 you know, maybe that's even more ambitious because I am not somebody who does that yet. I probably should have written is I'm someone who's learning to, or starting to review my journals to remember, learn and improve. And to me, that's, that's, that's more believable anything that you're you're writing in the journal you need to believe yourself you can't right. just write I, at least I, for me i can't just write you know uh, you know i'm you know i'm going to be you know a millionaire successful you know this and and do all that whatever until you know that i'm you know to pretend you know fake it till you make it kind of thing that doesn't really that doesn't jive for me you need to believe it especially if you don't believe it so yeah um, the the thing that I learned from Andy Dooley was, and he talks about a lot of this, you know, personal motivation. But he, he, what what he bridged a gap for me to go, okay, I want to achieve these goals. I'm not achieving them yet, and it just doesn't 
I, I don't feel motivated to do them if I'm just writing these out like, you know, I'm playing a character on TV. That's not that's not who I am. So he he bridged the gap and he would talk about, I am starting to, I am someone who is learning to, I am beginning to. And a lot of those, those, those connections really helped me go, okay, yep, that's, that's accurate. I can believe it. And now I'm excited. Yeah. That was one of the things you and I talked about, about uh, affirmations a while ago. And I think we've mentioned on the podcast yeah. before where, yep. you know, if you're feeling, if you're feeling bad enough that you need affirmations because there's some people walking around who just don't need them they're they they feel like they're on top of their stuff all the time so much that they don't need to tell themselves we got we got to interview some of those people that would be yeah we I, I, I want to i want to meet some of these people but uh yeah we i i found that you know when when i'm feeling low enough that i will benefit from affirmations it's when i'm also the most skeptical of believing the after the the sort of canned affirmations that you're going to find in an app or online where right. it's like, no, if I'm feeling bad enough that I need to tell myself these things, then I'm probably going to be skeptical of believing them in the first place. And that's when, you know, I, uh, just as, as an example, the affirmation of I am worthy. It's like, well, sometimes, you know, the, the times when you need to hear that you're worthy are the times that you're not going to believe that you're worthy. Right. And so I changed it to, I am more worthy than I feel like sometimes. Yeah, that's great. I remember, you, yeah, you had said something like that. I, I love that. And yeah, you can definitely, yeah, work work from affirmations because affirmations ultimately come from yourself. And so if you have a low opinion of yourself, in a, you know, during a depressed moment, then your, your, your brain is going to respond back to say, why should you believe, why should you believe yourself? Yeah, like you're you're not worth trusting. You're not worth believing that uh, that you're worthy or lovable or competent or any of those things. So, yeah, why why would you tell yourself this? But it's like, no, you can you can believe that you can almost use that negative talk aspect of your brain against itself by saying, no, I'm I'm more of this thing than I feel like I am sometimes. Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to I'm going to steal that a little bit more uh, often. So, for example, the, the other day I was writing information. I, I had some, you know, some meat and chicken. I need some beef and chicken. I needed to cook and I was going to cook it on my on my uh, panini maker. And and uh -huh. it just it just on cutting it out of the wrapper. You know, the the, the juices go everywhere and then I got to <laughs> rinse it off and then I yeah. gotta prep it. And then in my mind is I blow this up into like this huge deal before I know it. Uh, there's been times where but the weeks the meat's been sitting in the fridge for more than two weeks. And then by the time I try to, you know, cook it, it's yeah. rotten at that point. Right. You gotta so, away. you know, I, the other day I wrote, you know, cooking meat is quick and easy and not that messy. And so what I needed to do really was kind of, is I should have added what you said is it's, it, you know, cooking meat is quick and easy and is not as messy as I think it's going to be. Right. I like that. Yeah. Or, or even, you know, cooking meat is not the catastrophe that I make it into sometimes. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I think I think because because then it's like you're kind of giving that part of your brain that wants to catastrophize and make things terrible. You're giving it a little bit of a tip of the hat to say, hey, I know you're out there and I know you're waiting. You're waiting to jump on me to tell me that this thing is so much worse than it actually is. And I see you coming and I'm going to do this thing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, what's interesting was, you know, when we talk about just starting that process, just starting to do something and you'll see it's, it's, it gets a little bit easier to yeah. me by writing that that was me starting. And I did cook the meat that day, yeah, but yeah. that was, that was just kind of the, the daily affirmation slash intention. I was just like, okay, that was, that was me starting that. Okay. I'm just going to get, start taking action. And I mean, again, it was, you know, me just moving my hand on some paper, you know, with a right. pen but it was a physical movement. And yeah, not long after that, I was like, okay, well, I, I, I put that on paper. I, now it's kind of top of mind as I walk by the fridge, I open it, I see the meat in there. All right, let's just, let's just get started. Right. And, you know, looking back on it a week later, it's easy to say, okay, well, I could have, I could have worded that in a way to be more effective or more long lasting than the way that I chose in the moment. Yeah. But, you know, it's one of those things that Dr. Julie mentions about not letting the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. It's like just just putting down something that was better than nothing is is all you need to worry about doing in the moment. And then, you know, yeah, whenever whenever you journal out one of these processes or one of these goals, you have the right to always go back and say, okay, I could have worded that a little bit better, a little bit more effectively. I'm going to change it now, 
And so today, moving forward, I'll have even a better version of that to work off of than what I've been working off of the last week. And uh, yeah, just, you know, not not being so so tied into the way I chose to handle this a week ago and being able to say, OK, for the information that I had then, I made the best decision that I could make then. And now I understand something I didn't understand then. So I'm going to rewrite this and it's going to be even better for the version of me that looks back a week from now. Yeah, you're you're basically setting up your your future self for less work down the road and exactly. for doing things a little bit more effectively and for less frustration. You're 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 doing your future self a favor. Yeah, and so it's important to not uh, fall into this sunk cost fallacy of well, the first time I did it, I didn't do it great, so I'm not going to even even bother trying to do it again. It's like no, just acknowledge that you did what you could when you did. And now you you may have figured out a better way to do it, so you're going to move on to that, and and never never feel like, you know, oh, I've already put too many chips into this crappy poker hand, so I better I better stick with it and see it to the end. Yeah, it's like no, go ahead and improve your strategy right now, and and then when the next when the situation comes up again in a future hand, you'll have the skill to handle it better than you did last time. Yeah, what what helps me with those those situations is saying things to myself, such as uh, I'm learning to do hard things and yeah. I'm learning to do things little by little. And so then, you know, I, I, I do a, a little bit and then I'm okay walking away knowing right. All right, I'm going to come back to it and, 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 you know, keep, keep hacking at it. And it does start to get a little bit easier and easier and easier as I, as I do that. And just, you gotta, I just have to remind myself that that's going to happen because my brain is immediately going, no, this is going to be hard. Stop, right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and learning, I mean, that's, that's the hard problem with, with any positive change in your life comes at the expense of deciding not to trust your brain. This, this beautiful brain that has kept you alive and kept you, you know, allowed you to get through trauma and protect yourself and all that. You have to acknowledge that sometimes the things that it tells you are not the things you need to hear, even though it's done so much for you and keeping you alive, keeping a roof over your head, keeping you fed and employed and all this stuff, all this great stuff that your brain does for you. Sometimes your brain can be out to get you a little bit and you have to decide not to take its advice, which is it's hard to learn, you know, that process of when do I believe every thought that's in my head because it's going to keep me alive versus when do I understand that my brain does not always have my best interest. It has my yeah. it has my absolute bare minimum interests of keeping me alive in mind, but it doesn't it doesn't always have the keeping me happy or keeping me the most healthy as its motivation. So so believing it and taking it at its at its word has to be something that we do judiciously, not automatically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole reason why mental health is so important is it's really learning about our brain, the way we we think about things. And, you know, that's why the, the book is so great, because it really is a mental health toolkit to kind of help you understand how it can be used, how it is, how, you know, what, you know, it looks at the brain and what it does by default. And then what are the ways that we can make the most of it and and how, and, and the practical ways we can use tools to get what we want our brain to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, our, our brains are running off some pretty old software because, uh, you know, when, when it comes to staying out of the weather and having enough food and staying alive long enough to pass your genes on to the next generation. Um, those are pretty simple things. And that's kind of where our, our brain's software is still today. And, you know, being able to navigate the complex social structure of a corporate work environment and being able to have uh, fulfilling and exciting personal relationships. I mean, all those things are much more complex than hunting and gathering and staying alive long enough to have some kids. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's important to realize that our, our brains, um, our, our, our every impulse, you know, the, the way that we feel like we need to act in the moment may not actually be the best way for us to behave. And, and often it's not. Right. Yeah. And, uh, that, that, kind of plays nicely into uh the the next chapter or the next section we're going to be covering yeah. on the next podcast which is yeah. on emotional pain yes and uh there's there's uh, four chapters in there uh they're titled make it all go away what to do with emotions how to harness the power of your words and how to support someone and uh we're, we're excited to get into that 
yeah, I can't wait for the next section. I uh, I have a suspicion that after we finish going through the uh, was it eight sections of this book, uh, it's probably going to be my favorite that we've done. I mean, right now, No More Mr. Nice Guy, our first one is probably my favorite because I really enjoyed getting into that material. Um, but I I feel like you know this uh, this book when we're done with it, just because it applies to every, pretty much every human. I mean, men, women young people old people i mean there's something to take away from this book for absolutely everybody and while you know I've, i find the the understanding of the nice guy mentality does benefit everybody everybody who gets wh- how that works and where it comes from will be better off in their in their life and their relationships this one is so concretely available to just everybody to make their lives better i think uh when we finish this in what i guess five or six weeks it's gonna it's gonna probably be the leader in the clubhouse for me as far as personal development books that you and I have talked about. Yeah. It, it's, it's an easy read and it, it gives a lot of great, there's a lot, there's not a lot of fluff in it and it's just, Hey, this is the way things are, you know, or this is the way things typically are. This is the way they seem. And this is what to do about it. And right. that's what I like. It's, it's, you know um, and, and, you know, she cites some studies where appropriate, but it does, it's not overwhelming, uh, overwhelming you with, you know, with, with research and and numbers and data and stuff, so um, it's 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 definitely usable and it's it's enjoyable. So uh, yeah, it's 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 my favorite so far as well. Yeah, so let's uh, let's close out on one one additional plug for Dr. Julie and her work. You can find her at Dr. Julie on Instagram, and the book "Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before" is available wherever you buy your books and it's available in electronic and audio and physical. And I'm proud to say I own all three as of a few days ago, I've got the the hard copy. I've got the version on my e-reader and I also have the audible version. And uh, I can't say enough about uh, Dr. Julie and and what she's put in this book. So that's where I'm at. I'm looking forward to next week and uh, the motivation. If you like this, this episode on motivation, Again, I think you'll really like our next uh, our next series that we're going to hammer motivation and uh, the formation of good, healthy habits real hard. So uh, stick with us, and uh, yeah, that's that's where we're at this week. Dan, anything? Uh, any closing thoughts from you? Uh, no, I just wanted to wish you a great time at Disney and uh, a happy Independence Day. You too. You uh, you going to see some fireworks? Well, you um, have fireworks every night at Disney, so yeah. well that's true. But yeah, uh, we spoiled. Uh, yeah, um, I I will be blacked out or blocked out on my uh, Disney trips for Fourth of July because it's such a big day for crowds. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. The the second second from the bottom tier annual pass that I hold uh, will not be letting me come to the park on July Fourth. So okay. I will. Uh, yeah, we're talking about. Um, I, I may spend some time with a friend and her family, or. Um, I may end up doing the Baldwin Park thing that you and many of our friends have uh, indicated interest in on Facebook. So, uh, no, no firm plans yet, but I'm, okay. but I'm, look, I'm looking around at what what I might end up doing. Yeah, keep me posted. We got to create some uh, some video and content for our uh, our oh, new social point. media uh, uh, presence. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know what I what I might do is I might do a uh, I might do an afternoon like cookout thing with. Uh, with some friends and then, and then head over when it, before it gets dark, head over to the Baldwin park thing so that I can actually watch some uh, yeah. fireworks. But man, I watched the Disney fireworks last night, the magic kingdom fireworks from uh, this little restaurant that sells like hot dogs and fries and stuff. And they have, they have this great spot to sit and be able to see the castle really well. And the fireworks right above the castle. Oh, nice. And so, uh, yeah, we did that last night and it was, it was pretty mind blowing. I really enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, if, if I could come to Disney for the fourth, if I had like the $1,200 pass with no blockout dates, then maybe I would do that. But since that's not on the table, I may slum it with you on a uh, on Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Let me know. All right. Cool, Dan. Thanks. I enjoyed this uh, episode with you and I'll talk to you again soon. All right. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.